let's start. So this last lecture of the of the seminar, um, it's kind of similar to the one that I gave you on vision and language. But in that se in that case, I was talking about how we can combine uh, visual information and let's say textual and language information. And now I'm going to more how to how we can combine vision and and audio information. Right? What people are doing lately in, in this field. So. There's vision one side and the other side that will be whether talking about speech or audio. Okay, we know that in the end it's kind of the same, but you see that there are like different communities. You, during this course, you have mainly been uh, working on on speech, not that much in general audio or nothing at all. Probably uh, you're going to have uh, tomorrow. There's you're going to see more a bit more of audio because uh, Jody Pons will, will talk about uh, music, which is uh, some kind of audio, and which okay, it's kind of in between. It's not going to be speech. Um, in this field, nobody. the keyboard has nobody. You knew that already? Okay. Thank you. OK, so lately what um, there are, actually there are many works trying to bridge the two modalities. And that's uh, mainly due that if you remember, like in, for, to, in order to train this deep learning network, you need lots of data, right? And capturing this data. Um, okay. Caption data is not that bad, but labeling for supervised lear learning, that's, that's really costly because that, in many cases you require some kind of human intervention. But if we think that we, need, we want to perform tasks where we want to go from mo one modality, from visual modality to another modality like uh, audio or, or speech, uh, there are some good news here because there's already uh, some sort of data that kind of already uh, provide some supervisory signal that uh, maps the two of them, which are videos. Okay, So videos are a type of multimedia documents that they have synchronized, synchronized visual and audio data. And there are many words nowadays that they try to exploit this synchronization and see how, how far we can go from there. So um, lots of the, the work I'm going to present, or all of it, I think, it's uh, considering that we have video uh, signals uh, in some, in normally, in, for, we go from visual to so from visual to audio or vision to speech or the other way around. Okay, um, some people call this unsupervised learning, um, and and that's because actually to train networks uh, based on this synchronization, you don't really need labels or you don't need nobody or any human labeling uh, data. But uh, some of the people, when they see unsupervised learning, they are really thinking about um, learning the data distributions, which it would be not be the, the final goal of the task I'm going to present today. Okay, so actually nowadays there's a bit of messy technology in here. I'm going to talk about self-supervised learning, uh, which means that it's kind of using these also weak labels. That's some people they say that when you have labels that nobody really uh, generated, but you are using them as labels. That these are like weak labels because they tend to be noisy. Okay. So there are some technologies that actually, like these two years, have popped up to try to distinguish what people are doing in, in this field. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, you can think that it's kind of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning. So I'm going to f uh, follow talk about feature learning, cross-modal retrieval, and speech generation. So the lip reading I'm not going to talk about because I already mentioned that the other day. So. The first applications that we have are feature learning, which is like uh, how we can use these video signals to learn better features to represent whether images or whether audio signals. And the first example I'm going to provide is going to see how we can use uh, audio signals to learn better visual features. Okay. So that's, there has been a research group in, in MIT, in the lab from Antonio Torralba, that they have worked a lot on, on, on these fields. And they presented this, this work uh, a couple of years ago where they basically said, OK, um, we think that if we look at videos, uh, the type of audio that you, ambient sound that you hear on videos, it's normally that's related to the visual contents that, that you see. There's some kind of correlation there. So based on this observation, uh, they, here you have a couple of visualizations, visualizations where you see uh, frames from videos. And the corresponding coccalogram, you know, that's uh, some kind of uh, audio feature, corresponding to the to the to the uh, audio window around this video frame. And you can see that visually, they they seem to provide different visual appearance. Again, you can do this for many other 
uh, video frames, but the idea is that if, if you have uh, different statistics in this audio uh, feature uh, for different uh, types of visual um, images uh, with containing different semantics, why not using this to learn better uh, visual features? That's uh, the whole goal. So what they did is they say, okay, so we want to give it an image, we want to learn some features that would be useful for some task, whatever. And what they did as they were dealing with images, they used convolution neural networks, which is the classic architecture to deal with uh, spatial, uh, the spatial um, relations that, that are are represented in images between pixels, right? So what they did is, as they have lots of video, they could just extract the kilograms, and actually they used some statistics based on kilograms for all the video frames. So they had a huge amount of data to train a neural network, a convolutional neural network, that would go from a video frame to the audio statistics, yeah? They had enough data to, to train whatever amount of par parameters here. So once they had trained the network with some training data set, what they did is, um, actually they took, from the training side, they took uh, the audio features they had, they clustered them, so they used an algorithm called k-means, where we've heard about it in, in, other, in other lectures, so they created cluster based on the training data set, and then they took the images, the, well, the video frames from the, from the um, well, images from the um, test data set, and they extracted the audio features uh, learned from the commercial neural network. And when they, when they had that, they, they, they assigned each image to each of the audio clusters they had, they had learned from the training data set. Here, what I, what I show on, on this screen are just uh, three rows. Each of these rows represents uh, uh, the assignments of frames to three different clusters. Actually, they, they run it with 30, I think, but they, here you see like where the, those frames were, were clustered together in an unsupervised way and based only on the, on the visual features. What you see here in these clusters is that um, you see the top cluster, there, are, there seems to be some water. In the middle cluster, there are some kids and people. In the cluster in the bottom, this is kind of sports event. They are dancing, so there seems to be even more activity. I'll try to switch off the light, so maybe you'll see it a bit better. Yeah. Okay. Better. Yeah, and apart from these qualitative results, that's what they provide in, in, the, in, the, in the paper. They also uh, computed for every cluster, so for example, for the, these three clusters, the average of the actual uh, audio features that, that correspond to the, to the video frames. And you see that actually the, each cluster, they, they has some uh, distinctive audio features, and it's related to the semantics of, of, the, of the visuals, or the visual information, yeah? So they, they learn some visual features that, that make sense, that, that help in, in, that contain some real information for the semantics of the image. They also ran uh, another experiment. On, yes, hold on. Okay. Turn on the light. They also ran another experiment um, that uh, they do all, always, or most of the times when they, they have papers in this lab, where what they look is Given on, on this convolutional neural network that they look, they chose, let's say, some of the neurons from the convolutional neural network, and they look, uh, so they, they, they look some of them, let's say, they, 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 fix, they fix on, on one of the neurons, and they uh, fit the network with all the images for test, right? And then um, they choose the images that um, activate the most, the most the, the neuron, Okay, so they select it, and then actually they also have a, a method to say when, when there's the highest activation, as it's a convolutional filter, this activation actually corresponds to a local uh, area of the input image. And here what you see are the results of four neurons that they uh, found by looking at the responses of many, many neurons, and they, they saw that these neurons, they, were, uh, they learned to detect some uh, semantic uh, objects, let's say they had baby, grass, person, and plant, okay? But nobody told the, the network what was a baby or a grass or person or plant. Yeah, and that's, that's a nice thing. That they, they, kind of, they kind of learn a, an object detector with, with ro very raw object detector, but with any need of any labeling. It they were just using the audio and visual uh, information. Yeah? Uh, could you then back propagate through all the layers and then say this is the linear function given the setup for identifying the sound of grass or 
the sound. Or this is mapping images, sequences of images to sound, right? Yes. Yeah. It put, yeah. Yeah. So, and you're saying that if you input a lot of images, for instance, with a baby, right? Or a sequence with a baby, that it's mapping to a certain uh, sound, right? That's how it would work. Uh, so these are inter these are intermediate neuron neurons. Okay, so it's, what I'm looking here is that that when when I have pictures of baby, that that neuron in the middle of of the network will tend to be highly activated. That's what I'm saying here. Right. Okay, and what I think what you're saying is one step further. I think. Well, it's just like once you got into that neuron, so with yeah. all the previous um, uh, activation, yeah, and all, uh, that that would then be the function for identifying. But I mean, the, the function are the parameters of, of the function. It's what 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 define the parameters of the neural network. That's, yeah, exactly. and, and it's and the function works for baby. It's, it's the same. The function is the same for babies, persons, plants, or whatever. Okay. What activates more or less are the the features. So what I what I could let's say go back into the network is look at the activations of the features, um, and which would tell me like if if I take let's say if I take this image and I go I, I can remember. It's not written which layer it is, but if I go back uh, yeah, on the layers, what I'm going what I'm going to to do is to summarize like in each in in the feature maps, so not in the filters, in the responses of of the filters on the activations. I'm going to see where uh, the maximum activation was, but it's going to be something similar to this. I think that probably it's going to uh, close down the receptive field, but it will in, in this. So in this case, if I take this back, I, it will just provide me similar information. It will, it will just tell me like uh, where were the highest activations um, in the previous uh, layers. Yeah. I was just thinking that if you could do that, then you could also maybe compress it into a single step rather than having the, the multiple uh, functions that you do when that, you go through all the layers, right? So if you just wanted to do something and say, well, I guess that doesn't do the work. But no, because there are, there are nonlinear operations. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not really sure where you want to go to, but um, so what I, what, I, what I could go with here is just to go back and see where the activations at after each layer. Uh, I don't really so I don't see really see like very easily how to compact that. Okay, right. maybe there's some way, but it's not obvious at all. Yeah. And I think that what he was saying is like if in the end if, if you if you somehow so after each, after each layer there's always some nonlinearities, and that's what actually makes it. And feasible to compact everything. If there was no no entities, you would totally have one layer because you could compact everything in just a product of matrices. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I will, I will proceed. Yeah. If you want, we can discuss a bit no, later. No, I get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was from how we could learn visual features by using the audio signals. Yeah. What if we do, we do the opposite? Why don't we, uh, by looking at the visual information, if we can learn better? Audio, audio, audio features. And that actually, the same lab, they had this work. Um, okay, hope it will start running. Okay, so here you see um, this network is predicting, just by looking at, listening to the audio, uh, some concepts, okay? And that's, here you see the video, but actually the concepts that you see, they are related to um, the scene or the object. They, they are predicted only by um, looking at the audio, okay? And they have been learned with no labels at all. And that's, and I'm going to explain you how, okay? But what, what you're seeing now, it's like the results of a network predicting some concepts. Uh, these are scenes concepts and these are object concepts by just listening to the video and without looking. So that's why the, at, the, at the beginning the image is blurry. Yeah, they understand what it's doing the network. Okay, so now I'm going to explain how they do it. And and there were no no human, no human label, but there's a, there's a trick here. Okay, but I'll I'll show you now. So that's this this result that was obtained with SoundNet, and SoundNet is the architecture again from the same lab, same MIT lab. Um, where, what they do is they have a video a label, well, video frames here, not label at all. They take the the frames. Uh, video frames, and these video frames, they go through uh, these two convolutional neural networks, okay? These two convolutional neural networks, these are uh, uh, 
One of the ne neural networks, it's predicting objects and it's trained with ImageNet data. You should have heard about it, but it's like the most famous network for uh, visual classification, object image classification. And this will be like this network here. And this other network is called Placey CNN, which is like of similar in spirit of ImageNet, but instead of, of predicting a concept for objects like cats and dogs, it predicts concepts related to scenes like park, beach, classroom. Okay, and they are they, bo they are both kind of contemporary. So this network, they were trained with somebody that annotated some data. Okay, but they just they just took them off the shelf. Yeah. So what they do is they they take these networks, they feed the video frames to these networks. So these networks they they make these predictions like cat, dog, beach, whatever. Yeah. And these predictions they are used as labels for this other network. And this and this is SoundNet. SoundNet is the network that they actually train, and they train it uh, by using the raw waveform from a, from the video. So visual information goes this way, audio information comes this way, and then so they feed this in and they train this network so that this network would predict the same labels that these two other networks that were previously trained predict. Yeah. So so the the contribution is, is training SoundNet. Soundnet is the input is audio, but you want just that just with the audio, you want to predict the same levels that you had with ImageNet, uh, CNN, on places CNN, and that's how you learn all these filters, because you, you obtain the, the tags uh, weekly from those those, those labels from the, from those uh, networks. Yeah, so networks on, on the top they might make some mistakes because it's automatic, but it's for free. I mean, these are labels for free. Let's say. Yeah, somebody already trained them, so you just can forget about this. Yeah, so they train this other network, the SoundNet. They obtain they saw that they, with this, with the features they obtain from SoundNet, they were doing better than uh, some existing solutions from state of the art for audio engineering. So some, some, so all these other works you see here, these are people who really knew a lot about Oreo. They have spent many years thinking about what was the best feature structure for Oreo. And for this task, uh, they learned better features to solve the task that, okay, that described here. Okay? And, but this, so they, they learned better features without, with no effort. or Just let, just let the sound net to learn which were the best features for, for this task. But not even for this task, so actually, because SoundNet was, is not optimized to solve this, this task or this task. It's optimized to, to solve what I, what I showed earlier. But the features they discover, they work very well uh, for this task. They also uh, look at uh, the shape of the features in the, in the first layer, and they saw th something like this. So these are like 1D filter responses, some, some of the ones that, that the network learned. Okay? Just an, some examples here. They also look. Uh, deeper in the network in SunNet, and they they actually they run the same experiment as earlier. They look at uh, some of the, they chose some of the of the neurons. They look what kind of uh, sounds were generating a higher response, and then when they detected that, they they, they visualized the frames that were created to those sounds. And they also again they saw that some of the neurons they were related to baby talk, some of the other neurons they were related to bubbles, for example. Yeah, so, and that was, again, was trained with nobody telling the network were bubbles or bubble chalk. Yeah? Okay. You can later play the video. I'll, I'll move forward. So it's, not, it doesn't, it's not too long, but you can actually listen to the, to the sounds. Okay. So um, now that we, see, we saw how we could learn uh, better features for audio or, or extraction or for video extraction. There are some words that actually they combine both. This will be uh, this recent work where they learn also uh, features for visual and, and vision and audio. And here, what they do actually, uh, they, they train a network, well, actually, like yeah, this network that has different parts. And what they do is they, they train them. So that's, uh, that's, these are the details of the network. So they are, you see, these are, convolution, these are convolutional net networks that in the end they are uh, merged with these fusion layers. And they just um, input in the in the two towers. Like these are the visual frames. These are the audio uh, features. They 
yeah, that's a, a spectrogram, so it's, it's not raw audio, it's they first extract some spectrograms. So they have pairs of images and the corresponding spectrogram, okay? And then they train this network to predict if, if those two pairs, they correspond or not. And that's something you can kind of train for free, right? You have many videos, you, take, you have uh, pairs of images and spectrograms that correspond, and so many others that don't correspond at all, right? And so you can, you, you define a task, you invent a task, and you can train a network for that. In the end, you will obtain here, so this tower here, this part, will extract features, uh, visual features that can be useful for other tasks, and this tower here can, will extract audio features that can be used for other tasks. Yeah, and you train them jointly. Okay, that was, these were just examples for feature learning, which is uh, one, uh, um, task that captures the attention of many people. Now I'm going to another task, which is cross-model retrieval. Okay, cross-model retrieval means, sorry, means like, uh, what if I, I, I have, let's say, vision, so I have a, an image, and I want to, re to retrieve an audio clip, okay, but an existing audio clip. So maybe I have a, a large data set with one million audio clips, and I have an image, and I want to find which of these one million audio clips ma best matches that video clip. Yeah? Or the other way around. Maybe I have uh, some audio clip and I have one million image and I want to find the image that best matches that. Yeah? But, I'm, but I'm, I'm not generating a new audio or I'm not generating a new image. I'm searching in a large data set. Okay? So the first example here you see, you see some videos. Okay. So all these noises that you see, oh, all these sounds, sorry, that you see, actually they do not correspond to the, to the real... Uh, Okay, so now he's showing you. Um, come on. Yeah. Stop it. Okay. Is it quiet now? Yeah. So what, what you were listening, it was not the real audio from the video frames. It was just uh, retrieving uh, audios from other video clips that match the, the visual contents of the scene that you were looking. Okay? So how they do that? If I can do it, yeah. So what they do is uh, they, they recorded a, a data set, and so they extracted um, some, um, so for each, the idea is that for each, um, for some video frames, you predict that some sounds that should match those video frames. That's, that's what, what you saw, and how they did that. So that's what they did. They, uh, they train uh, this uh, architecture which like you have as input the video frames, the sequence of video frames. First you have uh, some convolution neural network, so this, this is just always the same one, uh, which uh, at the end uh, it has uh, some LSTM, so recurrent neural net network in the end, right? What you want at the output is to predict uh, the coquelogram. Did you see these coquelograms in other lectures? Okay, so it's going to predict the coquelogram. Uh, the LSTM, right? So you predict that, and based on the predictions, then you, you look for um, actual videos, actual, sorry, actual sound clips that will match the kilograms that you have predicted. And that's what you were, you were seeing. Uh, so to do that, they create a, a large data set that if you want to play with it, so it's, it's available online. Here at UPC we have a similar project. If you remember, the other day I talked about uh, that project with called Pick to Recipe, where given an image you would retrieve a recipe and the, the other way around. So we did something similar, but instead of, rec of retrieving uh, recipes from images, we had video and we retrieve audio that was matching the video and the, op the other way around. Yeah, but it's the same architecture. So here. So if you notice, you see the, an audio that might match the contents of uh, this lady who is teaching how to cook, okay? But uh, those of you, especially those of you who are Spanish speak speakers, you notice that the audio is in Spanish and the appearance of, of that lady is, is not Spanish at all. It looks like more Indian. And actually that's because the, the audio is not, does not really correspond to to that video clip, okay, but it might have sense, like the sounds of the recipes and somebody speaking, it kind of matches the content, the visual contents. 
And we also did the, the other way around. So this audio that you are hearing, it might correspond to this video clip, but it actually doesn't correspond. It's something that we found uh, just by with the joint embedding. Yeah. So we just we just uh, had the representation and, and look for, for look for the in the database the representation that was matching better the the the, the features that we extracted from from the audio. Okay, just to as a last example, um, I call this cross model translation. I'm not really sure. I was thinking a lot about how to call this, but then I call it cross model translation. You'll see why. So now I'm going to focus on speech. So what can we do between vision and, and speech? So what if we have uh, vision, actually video, frames, and we want to, to obtain speech out of it? That's the case of this work called bit to speech. You're going to see, uh, so here, <coughs> speech which is not, has been, senti senti uh, has been reconstructed. Reconstructed, I think it's the right word. Yeah. So. It's a, so this speech, I think, it has been reconstructed by just looking at the image. Okay, I think there are some better examples, but okay, that's it's, it's still a you see it's still an ongoing effort, but it's, people are looking at this, right? So what they, they were doing here, so they uh, train a network and a CNN that, uh, given a, a frame, it would predict uh, an audio feature, an LSP, that's a popular uh, feature for for speech, yeah? So you train a network to, to predict the LSP, and from this LSP, uh, it's possible to synthesize speech. As you have, many, you have uh, many videos of people speaking, you can train this network and do as much as you, want, as you can. This other example, um, it's actually the, op the, op the other way around. Okay, so now we are generating uh, video out of speech, right? So how they do that? Um, oops, it should be okay. Yeah. So how do you do that? What they what they check? Now they have a. So. We start from speech and we want to generate a sequence of video frames of the person speaking. Actually, we already generate the, the face part. So from the audio encoding, you extract some uh, features, uh, which are handcrafted features. There's, all of this is a convolution neural network on this uh, spectrogram or similar encoder. And then there's another branch here, which is the identity. So you must also feed the network with uh, an example of, of the face of the person that you want to, to be speaking, right? And then the network, what it's going to be is like for each of these uh, audio uh, frames, it's going to generate generate a video frame, and you do that for each of the uh, each of the audio frames. And the end, you you will generate a sequence of video frames. You put them all together, and you, that's, you see the result that you just saw. Yeah, now you see that's quite simple because there's not even a recurrent network here. So video frames, they are each of them is predicted independently. So probably you can improve that. And I think that's the last example. Oh, okay. yeah. So the idea is that uh, this video here, um, Obama never said this. Okay. So that's so they are here. different techniques, but this one is is. Okay, they are, one of them are better than others, but probably not, this is very popular because like, it, it, it shows how you can synthesize uh, Obama's speaking, right? It's a paper. The other one is the one with an avatar, and that's the one that actually has the paper about. Okay, so I'll just show you kind of how they do that. Uh, that's the, the last one, from, um, which is probably quite impressive. What they, did do, what they do is the input is the uh, audio, uh, the speech. And then there's a convolution neural network that will predict, in that case, the parameters of a, of a 3D model of a person speaking. Yeah? In the case of the paper of Obama, actually, it's, they, it, they don't synthesize the full image. Uh, they just synthesize um, the lips. So they parameterize the lips, and they, they predict how the lips should move. And then they use some uh, computer-generated uh, 
uh, graphic techniques to, to have him speaking. Okay? So it's not fully end-to-end. -end. Probably Santi was, has been discussing a lot about end-to-end -end or not end-to-end. -end. This is not end-to-end -end yet, but it, results are quite realistic. Okay, yeah, that's the Obama one. People like it a lot. And okay, that's what I was mentioning, that in this case, what they are actually reconstructing are the, the shape of the lips, and then there's some post-processing to actually have Obama speaking. Um, finally, just to conclude, here now at UPC, what we are working is in something a bit one step further, which is quite challenging, uh, which is to generate a sign language. So starting from, from somebody speaking, uh, to have an avatar that will be, should be speaking, like in sign language, so for hearing better people. Um, and also, we want to we want the avatar to to keep the the identity from the speaker. Yeah. So uh, that's a current research under that we're running. If you're interested in working with us, just drop me an email because we're very excited on that. We have a, a grant from Facebook, Cafe Two, to to play with this. So hopefully for the next year we'll be at least be working on this. Uh, okay. And nothing. I'll leave it here because Adrian is, is here. So thanks a lot for your attention.